Hello, good morning uh, or good afternoon or good evening, depending on which part of the world you're in. Uh, and welcome to the Blocks News webcast. Uh, today, uh, my name is Fredrik Svanberg and today we're broadcasting live from the Pixelab office in Sweden. And during the next two hours, we will highlight some features and applications and give you the first introduction to Blocks version 5. A little bit over a year ago, we did a very successful trade show uh, just before the pandemic hit the world at ISE in Amsterdam. Um, and our concept for this show was to run short presentations with a realistic application example for each of the many features in Blocks. I think we aimed for like a 10 minute presentation and we ended up well over 20 minutes, but it still worked out quite well. And, and that video is available on our website in uh, video and uh, Vimeo and, and YouTube channels. And if you're new to Blocks, uh, I still think this video is a very good introduction to the system, dividing it into three main application areas, display, control and interact. So if we start with display, you all know what digital signage is. And, but we have a slightly higher ambition with that with Blocks. We call it display management or screen management. Um, and so we, we just, just, don't on, just not only want to display content, we also want to uh, control which screen is going to play on and, and to, to create the interfaces for it. And then you can um, set up your screens as, uh, as a video wall or separate screen configuration. You can create interfaces for interactive information kiosks. You can also use mobile devices to control your environment. Perhaps you want to control which screen certain content is going to play on and which content you actually want to play. Because Blocks is a content management system with built-in scheduling and streaming functions. Then control. Uh, when you use blocks, everything is connected on a wired or wireless network. And, but with a control system, you also expect not only display control, you also uh, want to control the lights, for example, and sound systems, perhaps, in the same system. You also want to connect uh, the control to, to, uh, to buttons and other uh, uh, I.O. functions, sensors in the system. And sometimes those things control just some simple um, power on off switch, but sometimes they're also connected to more advanced logic, such as, uh, I mean, for example, when a show is over, maybe you want to, to, to close the curtains, you want to open the doors, turn on the lights and run some pause content, and Blocks can handle all this for you. Uh, another useful feature with the control system is that it lets you monitoring the status of your system. For example, the, the, the picture you see in the, in the bottom right corner there is uh, from the Louvre Museum in Paris, uh, where they have divided the museum into different sections, different rooms, where they can monitor the status of all, all equipment and all, all productions and all, all everything that goes on there and see the status and turn things on and off and off, of course. So these are also very important part, uh, aspects of a control system. And finally, interact. As Blocks is uh, uh, based on web technology, we get a lot of that for free. I mean, you know a web browser is interactive by nature, and we can use that when we create user interfaces in Blocks, uh, making control panels, and etc. Uh, but sometimes you want to take that a bit further. For example, you want to use mobile devices uh, to create maybe an audio guide or a mobile experience for your visitors. And then, then you want to know where they are. But perhaps you also want to know who they are and connect that information with the database with an RFID tag, which you then, uh, or you, you connect that RFID tag to an object where you play somewhere and that changes the experience in the room. So that connection with the digital and the physical is always very interesting. But we will come back to that later in this presentation as well. But what I want you to remember from this short introduction is that Pixelar Blocks really combines display, control, and interaction in one system. As I said, I will start to talk about Blocks applications with multiple displays and how you, what, what to think about in the different alternatives you have. And I will start with the, with the, with the most basic one. You have. As you can see in my illustration up here, you have a square that says Pixilab, and that is the Blocks server that 
sits on the network uh, and then in this case is connected to two in players, one for each of the screens that I have there. Two simple uh, Intel NUCs uh, just connected to two screens. And, and this setup allows you to use unlimited number of players. Uh, you can use active synchronization between the players. So if I launch two videos, you see they are playing back in sync. What we say there's screen, screen and content management. Uh, I can select any of those screens to take over them and run some other content. So I take over the right screen and then I can step through my slideshow here with some additional images from that trade show we did a year ago. Very nice. And now I take that away and then you can see that the, synch the video synchronize, go back to that uh, state that it was before. Uh, and just to mention the synchronization uh, in blocks has been improved over the last year since that last trade show. And so if you haven't used synchronization in blocks for a while, I strongly recommend you to test it out again. It's really good. Uh, it, it, it's active sync that's synchronized for, doesn't matter how long the video are. And we also support seamless looping of synchronized content, which are very good. Uh, so I removed that and I want to show you also how to integrate live feeds in blocks. So then I will move over there. So that is the setup and I will actually bring up a capture feed on the left hand side and a network feed on the right hand side. So let me, uh, yeah, it says ultra low latency capture feed on the, on the left screen. So that is a capture card straight into to the left player and, and the right is a network feed, an RTSP feed, from the same source. It's a laptop computer running PowerPoint. So Matthias, if you can just click in your PowerPoint, you can see that the the left screen is slightly, or the sorry, the right screen is slightly behind the left screen. So that's a little bit more latency. So that is the only thing I wanted to show there. I mean, if we look at the uh, illustration up here again, you see that the PowerPoint laptop is is, has an HDMI output, goes to an HDMI splitter. So the left side goes to the capture card straight into the left player and, and up to the to the screen. And that is more or less of zero latency. So the, 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 the reasons for using that is obvious. Uh, and then the other HDMI feed goes into a, an RTSP decoder box or encoder box and, and lets that stream out on the network. And that is what you see on the right hand side screen. The advantage with that solution is that you that you can show this uh, 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 content anywhere on your network, on any display, because it's on the network. So it's not connected to a physical device. So with that relatively low latency, it's very, very useful. Perhaps not for camera feeds live on stage, but for a lot of other applications, it would be great. But in my illustration, I have a small network camera there as well, connected directly on the network because it can send out an RTSP stream directly. It doesn't need an encoder box that I was that I needed for my HDMI feed from the computer. When you use individual players, one screen doesn't know where the other one is. It just knows that it can synchronize to the other screen, but it doesn't know where position-wise the other screen is. So that is uh, uh, why you need to pre-split and pre-produce all your content. So that might be a limitation for, for some applications, but, but it's also very easy if you just want to create this. This is how it looks in, in blocks. You have a display a spot group. And if I open that up, you see here, here are my two screens, my left screen and my right screen. So my left screen here has a tag called left and my right screen has a tag called right. You can give them any tag name that you want. And then I have um, in my block area, I have a synchronizer block here with two videos, the ones that you saw before. Uh, the left video is, it has a tag called left and the right one has a tag called right. So if you have two videos there or 15 videos, you just drop them into the synchronizer. You drop the synchronizer on the, on the spot group and it's done. Good. So next up, I will show you how you can use multi-output Pixila player. So now I will ask my nice assistant here to shut off one of the players and move the HDMI cable to the other player. So from a single player, I will now use two outputs uh, in the same setup on the same screens there. And um, uh, what you could see on my illustration here, I say interaction between spatial aware screens. And what do I mean with this? Uh, well, as I said before with pre-split, then one screen doesn't know where the other one is, but now they do. Uh, and, 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 and so you can, you can, you can create a, a, a unified pixel space of all your screen outputs and you can use that. You can also get frame accurate synchronization 
which is uh, very important sometimes and even required if you use uh, LED wall with multiple processors, then you can do that in this setup. You see the single player up there now has two outputs to, to, the, to the screen, but otherwise the setup is identical as it was before. I will open up my uh, uh, display spot group and I see my, I'm waiting for my left player here to start up. There it comes, very nice. Uh, so now it's, it was connected because it, it was restarted so to find out the uh, different outputs. Uh, so now we see that the left hand side screen and, and the right hand side of the screen is black. And the reason for that is if I open up the my left uh, the spot settings of my left uh, my, my, my player here and I go to the video audio tab, now I see suddenly I have two outputs before I just had one when I had a single HDMI connected to it. And uh, in addition to the resolution, the refresh rate and orientation, I now have a top and left position of my screen. And here it says 2020 for some reason. So I, I remove that and put zero in there and I click OK. And now you will see that I, I get the same content on both screens. You see left display, left display on both screens because now the screens are just on top of each other. And the content they're showing is just 1920 by 1080. So it shows the same content on both. So I go back in here, uh, video, audio tab. So what I want to have is I want to have 1920 and then I add 100 pixels for the bezel between the screens. So that is why I put in 2020 on the second output. And now that goes black again. Perfect. Then I need to create a pixel space that match this wider resolution. And I have a composition down here uh, where I have uh, created that. So 2 times 1920 is 3840 plus 100 is 3940, which I entered here, and then times 1080. So this is my pixel space. And in my uh, working space here, I have just a video. Uh, and then I had this red bar that I put in just for production purposes. You see, that is a bar that is 100 pixels wide and is placed exactly at 1920. You will not see this red bar when I put it on the screen, but, but for production purposes, it can be good to know where you will not see visible content. So let's put this on on my uh, on my screen. So now there it is and you see the video is playing and you don't see the red bar. Well, I can show you the red bar if I move it like this and then then you will see the red bar there, but I move it back to 19 sorry 1920 and now it disappears again. Maybe we should put in some nice background as well because this is a composition. So I just put in a nice image from ISE. And if I put this on top, it will cover everything and just goes on top like this. But if I put it behind or below everything, the video will be on top of the background image. Uh, if I select the video and I go to the behavior button. I see that this video has two behaviors. It has a move behavior and a scale behavior. Mike will come back and talk more about this a bit later. But this allows you to, 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 uh, to do interactive real-time effects with any media element in your composition. Uh, so I have here on my, on my touch panel, I have a, a slider so I can move. You see, I can move my video like this because it's connected to the move behavior. And I have also created some buttons doing more or less the same thing. I can go to 1000 pixels there and 2000 pixels there and then go back again at fixed positions. And you can see that the slider is following in there. I can even create a sequence of this using the task engine in blocks. So this is a task that I call a move queue uh, and it has a few examples. Basically the only thing I do is that I control the move value here. You say I set this to 1000 here, I set it to 2000 there and I set it to zero again. So let's, let's run this task. So I wait three seconds and then it moves to the center position. Then it waits three seconds more and it moves to the end position and then wait three seconds and move back to, to the starting position. And then it scales up as well because at the end here you see I connected it also to the scale value and moved that to 1.5 so it scales up to full screen. Um, and of course I can bring the scale down with my fader here as well which I had a manual control over that. As you can see, that is what I mean with the interaction between the, 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 the screens in this pixel space. Uh, next one up is that I'm going to ask my assistant again to, to restart the players once again. 
And what I will do now is that I will restart them as normal Windows computers. And this might sound a bit strange because normally when you use Pixilab players, uh, we always recommend that you buy the hardware without a hard drive, without an operating system. It's just a streaming box and you can boot them from a USB stick or you can move, move, boot them over the network with a, something called PXE boot, which is a very convenient function. So, so that's all good. But now we're booting them up as normal Windows computers, the same hardware. And it looks like that. I mean, now it's one player per screen again. Uh, uh, but as you can see, it's normal Windows on them. This panel is, 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 is created in, 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 in blocks. It has no styling whatsoever. It's just buttons and sliders, but full functionality. You can literally create something like this in a couple of minutes. And of course, now it's a touch panel, but this could be your phone. So you can walk out in the exhibition and control everything that you're running on. So that's great. Uh, the, the second example is quite similar. Uh, I'm just going to put e another touchpad on my... Looks a little bit nicer. Uh, it has some styled fonts and it has uh, graphics and invisible buttons. But basically it just takes me to another page where I play a video. I can do some language selections down here of the text. And I can jump back. I can go to another case story here and look at this nice installation in Dubai and go back again. This is um, this, uh, uh, this panel is uh, also all done in blocks. Doesn't require any other uh, outside production tools or anything. The styling is done by CSS. If I remove the styling, you would actually see that now the buttons just looks like normal bu buttons, uh, box buttons again, and, but they still have the same functionality. Uh, and I uh, re put back the CSS and the styling comes back just like this. The third example is actually from a real installation in Brazil. Uh, from the beer museum at the brewery at the, in the south of the country. Uh, you could see this nice interface, which they had on about, I think, 10 touchscreens in that museum, doing different interactive small games and stuff. In this case, you see those beer caps here. They spin off and they tell you how to say things in different languages. Uh, and you can see you can trigger a few of them and they animate quite nicely. Uh, I think these could... Perhaps been done with the behaviors and functions inside blocks with the animation, but but it would probably not be the right tool for it. There are much better tools for it, and you should use the right tool for the job. In this case, it's a, it this is all done in Unity, uh, and then it's exported as HTML, as an HTML project, and played back in blocks just through a normal web block. So this is a normal spot, uh, which can then, of course, be combined with blocks, graphics and other things. And even the functions that are programmed in Unity and HTML, uh, the, when I press a button here, that button press could, of course, control the, the, the displays or the lights or whatever you want to do, because it's all connected to the block system. I will set a different interface on my... Um, Actually, I will do this. And uh, so now those two players are Windows computers. So I can remotely control them, controlling blocks, PowerPoint, VLC players, other applications, simulation applications, whatever you need to do. And I will come back to the screen and content management. Uh, but, but the PCs, they, they can run standard Windows, Mac or Linux or whatever. But they are now normal computers, not standard Pixelab players. And the first thing is I can select a PC. So I can select PC1 or maybe PC2, and then I can, I can bring up the mouse. You see, I can move the mouse from here or click the, um, my mouse button like that. So I, I remotely controlling each PC in any way that I want. And I can, of course, launch blocks on them as well. So now I'm, I'm launching blocks on the left hand. And of course, you can do this at the same time. I'm now launching also blocks on the right hand side. And I, you can see the synchronizer works perfectly also. Now I'm running Chrome in full screen on a Windows computer, of course, blocks uh, connecting to the block server. OK, I disconnect blocks, go back to the Windows desktop again. And now I want to do something else. I want to do a um, presentation. I see I have my PowerPoint presentations in here. 
that is actually stored on on Matthias uh, OneDrive. Uh, but I click on one of the PowerPoints here and it will open PowerPoint. I get my controls here so I can step through my PowerPoint. Very nice, like this. And, and I can launch a different PowerPoint presentation like this. You see, it goes very quickly to, to come up like this. I go over to, uh, sorry, not to movies. I go to PC2 and I go to movies and I, and I, I launch um, uh, the, oh, sorry, I launched the, uh, yeah, sorry, DLC player uh, just running whatever video that I have in my in my folder here and and I can jump in this video uh, jump a few steps here and I can pause my video and play it just with a remote control function like this interface created in blocks but this remote application running on on the Windows computers like this and coming back to let's go back to PC one with the presentations that I have here I, I talked about sc uh, con again screen and content management you see that I can have screen control but but how about content management now when I'm running uh, I mean a normal native app on the Windows so I will now ask Matthias can you add another you see I have three PowerPoints here now can you add another PowerPoint presentation and tell me when you're ready I think I'm ready you're ready and I update my screen yeah and you see PowerPoint another PowerPoint presentation appears in my user interface automatically he just dropped that in his OneDrive or whatever storage where you have it you can of course have a folder somewhere that you want to do like this so uh, any applications can be controlled in this way uh, sure there will be a lot of questions about this but we will take those a little bit later so what I want to do now uh, as a final demo is to show you that I also have a power button down here so if I then switch off the power of um, screen one or PC one and I go to PC two and I, I switch that off as well and you see now it's just a shutting down windows and uh, and uh, while uh, while those PCs are now switched off, uh, they um, I can of course not remote control them anymore because they're switched off. But still, the uh, the power button actually still works because that's wake on lawn, so that is still active on it the PC. Not. So so the the PC two there is actually off right now, and I, if I press power on that one, you will see it turns on, and now they will start up as normal Pixel app players. So even if the PC was shut down the wake on lawn function would still work in this, this interface. So I, I think this, this opens up a lot of interesting possibilities. So I want to talk about uh, quickly about um, the licensing of blocks. Uh, the blocks license is a perpetual license. You pay once and, and you, you own it. Uh, you, you pay for a base license and a small extra additional fee for each what we call display spots or each spot. Uh, there's a small additional fee for that. There is also an additional fee for some premium blocks, as we call them. Uh, we will come back to some new ones, 3D block, panorama block, but also for the live video, there is a small extra fee for it. But it's quite easy to understand and you can contract your, your, your local, uh, part, lo local Pixel App partner or distributor to get more information about that. But there is a license item that I want to highlight a little bit. It's the, um, uh, there is also an additional uh, fee for it. We call it the, the mirror service. And, and uh, this is a, a, a very good, uh, could be very important. As, as the block server is a single point of failure, that, I mean, if the block server doesn't work, then nothing in your system works. So it's important to have good a good uh, hardware um, which the server runs on and some safety around that and what we provided with this function is is a redundancy feature for increased reliability basically a fallback solution if, if the server fails you have the block server normally like this connected to the network of course and the mirror service is not a backup service where it takes snapshots with different timestamps uh, the mirror service is what it's called. I mean, it's it's the it it mirrors the current state of the active service on a separate computer on the same network. Um, so this is how it looks, uh, where you have the mirror server connected to the second network port of the active server, uh, constantly mirroring that result. And that is typically what fixed installation projects and museum wants they want to have if something happens they want to get back to exactly as, as it was before it happened and that is exactly what the mirror service uh, allows you to do if something happens you just move the license key and you move this network cable from the broken server to the mirror server and then the mirror server becomes 
the active server again and everything including players and lights and everything just connects automatically again and the system is up and running within minutes uh, just quickly uh, the pixelab website uh, there's a new blocks page here uh, with some very nice animations takes you through how to put blocks in sp on spots uh, server there the interaction between different screens from the smallest phone to the largest LED wall uh, and uh, the different functions that I showed you a little bit about before here is the uh, the introduction video uh, the 20 minute piece and here you can check out some live effects of some of the functions that you can do we will speak more about that but what I wanted to come to is actually at the bottom here you find a section called get blocks here you can enter you send an email to us and uh, you can get a, a cloud account or an evaluation key or a full setup depending on your needs uh, so so uh, go here and mail us if you're interested in that and here you, you also find the whole collection of all our training videos quite a few now and the blocks manual and on the website we also have a nice list of uh, projects and that brings me up it's time for our first guest speaker of today it's um, Morten Ranmar uh, from No Parking, who will speak about some recent projects and how they bring in blocks into their concepts. So let's call Copenhagen. Uh, Max, do we have a connection with Copenhagen? Yeah. Okay, very good. So thank you and enjoy the rest of the program. Thanks. My name is Morten Ranmar. I am the CEO of No Parking. We are a Copenhagen based uh, experience design company. Uh, we do exhibition design, uh, we do technical design and content design and uh, implementations for museums especially. Today we use Blocks as our main tool for museums, but during our voyage with Blocks, we have communicated with Pixilab and, and had some requests and they are listening to requests and they often come up with solutions that are even better than our requests. But but, but, it, but it's really nice to have a company behind that that you know uh, understands your needs and comes from the industry. And at the same time, we had a client who wanted like a small installation done. And we then convinced them to, to try out Pixel Out Blocks. So this client uh, got a nice deal for, for being the, the test bunnies for, for a, a Blocks installation. And we got a good first-hand experience in, in using blocks in a real installation, which proved to be very, very good. Uh, and we were, of course, expecting to be driving out to this client uh, a lot of times, but it didn't really happen. We, 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 we called them once in a while, is everything fine, is everything running? And yeah, it works. Uh, it, it, it turns on in the morning, it, it shuts off uh, as it should in the evening. We can we can say that uh, we were we got a really good reliant case from the beginning and uh, from that on we we never looked back. When we get a new exhibition a new assignment, uh, the first thing is al always to go in and look at the infrastructure. What do they have? What kind of room are we working at? Specifically, of course, it's it's the light and network situation when we're talking about blocks, because we need. The network to be there for for the, the players and today we also need network to be there for projectors and then of course the lighting conditions need to be ideal for if we want to use projections how many stories do we want to put on screens and how many of them do we want to put on graphics there, there are all these uh, these things that need to be discussed and tested out we normally set up the exhibition so we can access them from from home over the internet so we can quickly go in and, and fix something that, that, that's not working or a text that's uh, wrong, needs to be updated, put a new image in or whatever is needed. I'm going to talk a little about two cases uh, that we did with blocks. The first one is called Naturkraft. And it's kind of like a nature experience center. When you go inside, uh, there's the, an exhibition hall with some, some pavilions and some domes. And uh, here we use blocks to control everything. So first of all, the exhibitions themselves use an uh, advanced lighting system from Grandma. Uh, and uh, 
the grandma is actually a, a lighting computer that that uh, that controls a lot of different things in the light. We're not doing this directly from blocks, but what we're doing is that we are we are starting different scenes in the grandma system. So, uh, for example, in the morning we have uh, a, a special lighting scheme. So we'll call that when the exhibition starts up, and later in the afternoon we'll maybe call another scheme. We do also have lighting sensors that uh, evaluate the incoming daylight through uh, large windows and uh, the light is adjusted to uh, compensate for that. Um, all screens, projectors, everything are turned on by the block system. Two of the exhibitions uh, use pretty advanced projections. One of them is a dome projection which we mapped in uh, WatchOut uh, using the WatchOut uh, 3D mapping feature. And the whole watch out uh, is then, of course, controlled by blocks. And that's a standard feature in blocks, so you don't need to set that up. That works out of the box. But what we're also doing is that we have a lot of uh, auxiliary timelines, extra timelines and blocks that can play when somebody does something in the exhibition. So we have some sensors in the ex exhibition. For example, one of them is a touch sensor. Some other ones we have to blow into something. And, uh, and, and, and then you see how, how nature reacts to wind and things like that. The other blocks case that I want to talk to you about is uh, a museum we're doing in the northern Norway. It's very high up uh, above the Arctic Circle. And this museum uh, is also going to be totally controlled by, by blocks. One of the really nice things about this museum is that we have uh, video projections down on a lot of faces of pavilions. So if you can imagine square pavilions standing uh, in a big exhibition room and all the, the, the walls of the exhibition pavilions are then projected with patterns, uh, nature footage uh, that's shot, but also animated footage uh, of fish and, and, and uh, the, the, the resources that we find in this place that people came for. Um, so, uh, of course, when we have multiple projections, our normal approach would be to use watch out as we did on, on, on the previous case. But in this case, we actually fo found out that the new synchronization uh, utility in blocks can actually do the job. So, uh, so we have multiple uh, full HD projections, uh, multiple computers being synchronized to the synchronizer uh, block and it actually works really, really well. So Blocks takes care of uh, playing that, those synchronized projections. Um, and of course, we also have normal uh, interactive screens that, that have menus with content that you can dive into, uh, being articles, uh, uh, videos, uh, audio recordings, and, and other stuff that the museum provides. Another thing that we're using in this exhibition is actually a new feature in, in blocks coming up now is the 360 panorama. So we did some tests with this. We haven't shot the scenes yet, but we did some tests and uh, we put that into blocks and it works straight out of the box. So what we're going to do at the museum is that we're going to like point out to other places that people can go and visit in, 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 in close to the museum. And, and give them a preview of what they can go and experience here. And all that is now being done with the 360 panorama block. And uh, talking about uh, custom user scripts, uh, this is a really, really powerful uh, thing of blocks. And, and of course, not everybody can do it because you do need to have like a real programmer in your company or, 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 or get somebody aboard who can do real programming with the JavaScript syntax. Um, but uh, we're lucky to have such a guy and uh, he's also done a very, very nice other thing. He's done a script which evaluates, uh, goes through an exhibition and all the devices, asks the current status of these devices and gives us uh, a status uh, of, of the whole exhibition. So we can say we can do a health check of an exhibition from, from outside the museum. Here in the office, we have then a screen to monitor the health of, of our current exhibitions that are running out there. 
uh, and each exhibition then has a green or a red light. If the red light is on, then something is wrong and we can then press our way in and, and see where is the problem. For example, the other day uh, I saw a red dot. I called them immediately and say, said, uh, you had three screens on the first floor that are not running. Are you aware of that? And then this guy said, no, uh, nobody told us about that. Uh, he was uh, on his mobile phone. I heard him rushing up uh, in the exhibition room and saying, ah, yeah, of course, we have the power cut off because uh, some, some builders are here doing something. But thanks for letting us know anyway. So with a tool like that, we learn about the problems before the client, which makes us look very good when we're calling them and not them calling us. Uh, so that's a pretty strong tool and something that probably could not have done, been done without blocks. Thank you, Morten, for that great success story. Hi, I'm Mike from Pixelab, and I'm here to tell you a little bit more about what's new in Blocks version 5. First out is the updated locator. It has two new location methods that have been added, GPS and QR codes. GPS makes it suitable for outdoor applications, and here is a video that shows you how the locator can be used. I'm here in downtown Linköping, in front of this building that looks like some sort of castle. Let's see what's here. Bishop Giesel of Linköping first built a bishop's farm with a limestone castle in 1149, after King Gustav Vasa carried out the Reformation in 1527. That was indeed an old castle. Now, let's move over to that enormous church over there and see what we can find. The Linköping Cathedral harkens back to the Middle Ages and is about 800 years old. However, its history began in the 11th century with the construction of a wooden church. Later, around 1120, a stone church was built, a basilica of about half the size of the present building. This last slide is a panorama image of what it looks like inside. Let's go in and check it out. That looks interesting. I wonder who that is. Since we're inside, I can't use the GPS. So let's try this QR code instead. Field Marshal Axel Sparre was interred here in 1728. This is his funerary hatchment, carried as part of the funeral procession before being placed here on the wall. In some cases, it's not practical to use a QR code. Then you can use a simple number, as you can see here. I'll switch over to Swedish for this one. Now I just enter the number shown on the sign. Yet another option is to use an on-screen menu to pick an object that interests you. So there you have it. Four different ways to access content that's relevant for where you are. A GPS, a QR code, a number, or a menu. So that was a quick summary of what's new in the locator. And the GPS feature is based on information that has been added to the spots. Spots are these uh, things that are over on the, on the left-hand side in the block's user interface. And they are things like displays uh, or just physical locations. Essentially, a spot is a place or a location. And the, these locations can now also be identified by their uh, geolocation uh, with a latitude, a longitude, and a radius. 
the same goes for the display spot and that's in addition to the location IDs that have been there uh, in the past. In addition to specifying a geolocation zone, you also need to enable the GPS mode inside the locator. So let's track down the locator that was used in this uh, in this application. You can see that was the, the block that you show, uh, saw in the video. And here is the uh, locator that was used. And you see the GPS button and the QR scanner button buttons here. Um, and these can be enabled or disabled individually. So now I have them both off and it works the same way as it done in the past. And then you can turn them on individually. You can also turn off the numeric keypad here uh, if you don't want it. For instance, if you want to use an on-screen menu to choose your location. And you saw an example of that as well at the end of the video. And that uh, example, I can show you what that looks like here as well. As you can see, it's just a, a plain old composition, which is a, a, a an assembly of uh, content and buttons and stuff. And uh, there are in the, in, invisible buttons on top of each of these uh, objects that you may want to navigate to. And they just take you to that spot or, or to that page in, in the block, as you can see over here. So that's the new locator, combining GPS, QR code, uh, the numeric keypad, and a menu to access content relevant to your location. Now let's move on to the 3D capabilities of blocks, beginning with the panorama block that's been in there for some time already, but you may not be aware of it because it's a fairly recent addition. So this is an example of the panorama block. And you can see that you can move around in this room and you can you know, zoom in and zoom out and uh, essentially navigate. Uh, it uses regular buttons either out here, uh, like I can do, use them for positioning the, uh, the panorama, or you can also use buttons as markers inside, uh, like the, uh, the little flashing blue circle I have here. And there's another one back here around the clocks. And these buttons are just regular blocks buttons uh, that take you, in this case, take you to a, uh, a, a regular block that has some text, some images. And that could be a video, that could be uh, whatever you can do in blocks can be on these, on these other pages. Let's go back to the room. Uh, there is another one. Uh, linked to the map here and that actually leads to another panorama block so you can use these uh, markers as sort of gateways between uh, different parts of, of the of the world uh, and you can again zoom in and zoom out and here you can go back inside and navigate around and you can build a an environment in that way the panorama block is based on a panoramic image and i'll bring up a couple of such images here on, on the Flickr website. You can see it's these kind of weird looking images and they look weird because they are like a wrap around uh, with you looking in all the directions uh, as a single single image. They are sometimes called equirectangular, this, this kind of image format if you want to Google for it. And there are specialized cameras that you can use to take such images. Uh, let's show some of them here. Uh, and the advantage of such cameras is that they are specialized, so they take a very good panoramic image, and also they take it as a single image. So if you have things moving around, uh, like people or cars or what have you, uh, this is preferred because it takes it as in one shot. Uh, another option is that uh, you can uh, take a, an image using your phone, uh, with a, a free app such as the Google Earth app. There might be more apps to, uh, to do this, but this one is taken right outside the Pixelab office. And you can see it's a rather old brick uh, industrial building. I've heard someone say it's the oldest still working industrial building in, in the city here. May very well be the case. Uh, and you can see that it looks okay, but there are a couple of artifacts you can see in the wall here, and there's another one down on the sidewalk here. So they, they tend to not be perfect, but they're good enough for a quick uh, test shot or maybe pitching to a client. Um, and the way you take such an image is that you use your 
your phone and you you start the Google Earth app and you say, I want to take panoramic image and then you have to rotate around, take picture, 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 picture. And then at the end, the app will stitch all those pictures together and create this kind of, of uh, surround image from them. Finally, if your environment is made in 3D rather than being a physical place, you can, you can render out an image from your 3D program, like the one I have here of this classroom. Uh, and you see it works in exactly the same way. Uh, and you can zoom in, you can zoom out, and so on. Uh, so the, the end result is the same. It's just that this one came right out of a 3D program as a ren rendering of, of a panorama image. The panorama block also works really well on a touch screen, and I have a touch screen next to me here. So let's see if I can find a block to show you here. Um, there is one here. This was the one that you saw in the uh, in the video uh, earlier about the locator, and it's maybe a little bit hard for you to see in the uh, in the uh, in the recording. Uh, or, or in the camera, but you can see that I can spin around in the same way as you saw Max do on the phone there. Um, and you can zoom in, you can zoom out. And this image is also actually just taken with the, with the mobile phone. This came out better than the one out in the street, probably because there are lots of little features and lines and stuff going on that makes it easier for the Google Earth app to match up the uh, the uh, the parts of the image and, and and stitch it together okay that was the panorama now on to the brand new 3d block let me go back to this one that we just saw uh, because there are a couple of these markers that i told you about in the room earlier you can see those markers as again these little flashing circles here but in this case these don't lead to other panorama uh, blocks these re lead to uh, to 3D blocks. So if I would click the skull here, for example, you can see the skull appearing on the screen. And this isn't an image or a video. This is a real three-dimensional object. You can see it can even contain little simple animations as the one you can see here. You can zoom in, you can zoom out, you can spin around and so on. So this is a way that allows you to bring in three-dimensional objects into blocks. Uh, let's take another example here. You can see we have this little uh, cooker thing here. And if I click on that one, uh, it does the same thing. But this one has a couple of markers added to it as well. Uh, you can spin it around. There's a little animation going here. And there are some regular buttons up in this corner. And these buttons allow you to, to position the model according to these markers. So this one goes to the marker at the top here, and this one goes to the marker at the pump here. Uh, but these markers are also buttons, and they can also bring up uh, content. So if I would click the burner up here, I can get additional content. And this is just a, another block. This is a composition block consisting of some text and an image. And again, this could be video. This could be any kind of content, a website maybe, or any other content that you can uh, use in blocks. And if I would go over to the pump, I can switch over to that information over here. So that shows you what you can do with a 3D block. Uh, so let's take a closer look at how you actually make such a 3D block from scratch. And I'm going to add a, uh, another block. So I pick a 3D block here. And what do you call these things if not to test? You end up with lots of test blocks when you do these kinds of things. And since I want to show it on the uh, touch screen that I have on my left here, or on my right from your point of view, uh, I'll make it uh, taller than it's wide. And then it looks just like any other block, but in this case I can drag in a 3D, uh, a 3D file. So this is such a 3D object, and you can see it spinning around on the screen here. Now. If I go back and publish this on the touch screen, you can see it's, it does the same thing. You can zoom in and zoom out and so on, just like you could do on the panorama block. I have another model down here, which is a scanned in model. So you can see it's a helmet and I'll get rid of that cube. And this works in the same way. You can zoom in, you can zoom out. Okay, uh, so this is a, uh, 
a model from the Swedish Royal Armoury. So special thanks to these guys that they have published a lot of their models on a place called Sketchfab that we will look at later. Uh, so you can get these kinds of models there if you want to demo it uh, or, or just have a look at them. Uh, so let's see how we can add some of these markers on this 3D model. And those are really just regular buttons. So I add one button to the front of the helmet here. And you can see it kind of sticks to the front of the helmet. And I'll add another one to the back. So we put one like right here. Okay, let's call the one on the front one and the one on the back two. And these are again just regular blocks buttons and you can style them so they look different or, or maybe are totally invisible in some cases that make, make sense. Uh, and then you program them just like you program any other button in blocks. So let's say you want this button to do something. It can do anything that you can do in blocks, including controlling things in the room, turning on a light or what have you. But in this case, I would like this button to just spin around to show the back of the, of the, uh, of the helmet and maybe zoom in a bit. So for this marker, I would say, I want to have this kind of close up view on this, on this uh, ornament on the back of the helmet. So I'll set the pose associated with this marker and then I go back to the one on the front and I'll program that to go to a local block and then I say this should go to marker position 2. And now if I go over to my touch screen here you can see I still can manipulate it, I can zoom in, I can zoom out and if I click this button it spins around and it shows that ornament on the back of the helmet. So that's essentially how you create uh, 3D models, uh, how you use 3D models in, in blocks. But how do you get them? Uh, well, for real physical objects like the helmet that I'm showing you here, uh, you need to use a professional grade 3D scanner, which is how this model was made. But if you just need to have models for testing purposes uh, and to play around with, there are a couple of good resources. And again, we'll put these links in the, uh, in the uh, email we'll send out to you. One is the Smithsonian Museum in the US. And here you have a whole bunch of, of uh, nice 3D models. And if you go into one of them, you can see that you can download the model right here. And it's provided in the format that is used by Blocks as well, which is the GLB uh, standard format. It's that, that's a kind of a web standard format for, uh, for 3D content. So that's how you can get a model. Another place which is a great source for 3D models is Sketchfab, where you have a wide variety of, uh, of objects. Uh, and you can, you can take a look at them here. And some of them you can download. If there's this little gray arrow up in the corner here, that means you can download that model. And then you can use that model in, in blocks. Uh, if you need to edit 3D models, you will need a 3D application. And a, a great uh, and free such application is uh, this one, Blender. Uh, it, has, uh, it can import and export a wide variety of 3D file formats. And uh, DLB is one of them. Uh, but it can also bring in various other standard file formats like OBJ and, and FBX and... Uh, <clears throat> all the usual suspects. Uh, and then you can also br build these kinds of basic animations that I showed you with the pump or with the, uh, with the skull there. Those can be created in Blender and then you can export a GLB file from Blender that can then be brought right into blocks. So that's 3D in blocks. But why should you use blocks to show 3D content? There are many other ways to show off 3D content, including Sketchfab that we just looked at. Uh, but as you've seen, blocks makes it extremely easy to create and change uh, your content. You can just bring things in and you can manipulate it. You can add these markers and you can program them very easily. Uh, blocks also lets you combine multiple media types, not just 3D. So you can combine 3D as you see me do here, for example, with a panorama block or with uh, other 3D content, with still images, with video, websites or anything else that blocks can show or present on the screen. 
Uh, Blox also connects the virtual 3D world to the physical world through its control functions, and, and such as being able to turn the light on. Maybe you have a, a touch screen where you have the uh, 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 an, uh, an object that you can spin around and you can zoom in on it, and then you have the real physical object sitting there in the room, and then you can do things like turning on little lights on the physical model as you in interact with the 3D model, or, or anything like that. You could even like putting it on a, on, a on a turntable, and maybe if you turn around the 3D model, the physical object can track with you, but maybe that's in some kind of glass enclosure or something like that. So all those capabilities are what blog blocks brings to the table in terms of uh, 3D. And now let's move on to some new behaviors. As you may know, behaviors provide fine-grained interactivity and effects. So let's take a look. I'll drag a block to another block to the touch screen. Uh, let's see, it's the one I have up here. So here on this block, I'm using uh, two behaviors, a move behavior and an opacity behavior on these texts here. These play the burger, play the hawk. So that shows you how behaviors can control individual elements, in this case, the, just the texts here. And these are bound to the, to the uh, playback state of the respective video. So if I play that video, you see the text goes away. If I play that one, that text goes away. If I stop that one, the text comes back. And when that reaches the end, the text comes back. So that's a very simple and very basic example of what behaviors can do, that they can go in and touch individual elements and provide interactivity. You saw some examples in Frederick's demo earlier when he did that with a live, uh, with a video feed that he could manipulate both by buttons with, with a sequence of steps in the task and with a slider. And if you look at these texts here, you can see that the texts do have a behavior because they're shown in italics here. And you can see the two behaviors, the move behavior and the opacity. And they are both being activated by the Hawk video playing. The same with the burger, has the same two, but they are being activated by the burger video. These particular be behaviors are bound to local spot parameters, here the playing state of, e of each of the videos, but they can of course be bound to anything in the block system, including external inputs. Here, by the way, are all the behaviors that are now available in, in blocks, so there's quite a, quite a bit and new behaviors are being added all the time. So as you can see, behaviors lets you interact with or link individual elements on screen or in the room. Now, Blocks 5 brings some new capabilities to behaviors, such as the new Classify behavior, which lets you work with CSS in a more dynamic way. CSS is the standard web technology used for styling and effects, and it's what's being used in, in, in Blocks to do all kinds of effects, like changing the look of buttons, changing fonts, and so on. And if you've work, done any work related to web technology, you, you're quite familiar with that, because it's not anything Block-specific. So let's bring on another block here, this one, onto the touch screen. Here you can see an, an example of uh, such CSS in, in action. You can see the little arrow bobbing up and down here. And if I select the arrow here, you can see that it has this CSS class pump here. If I take that out, you'll see it stops moving. And if I put it back in, it starts moving in. So that's just a few, like three or four lines of CSS that makes that animation when you add that, that class name here. The new classify behavior essentially allows you to apply such effects conditionally. In this case, it's either there or it's not there. So th this one, this particular one isn't conditional. But I have some of these dynamically applied behaviors, like the flower you see here. You can see the flower scaling down, and this one scales up. And on this one, you can see it scales up. And you can also see the C starts to, to scale up and down here, while the B and the A does not. So the C apparently has some other behavior compared to the other guys here. So let's take a look at that one. We're inside the scroller here, and we are inside the C, this one here. And you can see the, the character that we have up here. It has a classify behavior that applies the class Pulsar when the scroller is at position three. So it's ABC, that's the third position. So that's 
a way to dynamically apply a class only under certain conditions. And if we want to reuse this behavior, we can just copy it. And then we can go back to the, uh, to the top level and we select the text at the center here and we just paste that behavior in there. So now you can see it has the same behavior over here. Now if I scroll to the third position, this one will start to scale up and down and so will the text here. So that shows you how easy it is to use behaviors and how this can be used to add dynamic behaviors as well. Another new behavior is the press behavior. And the press behavior extends the power of buttons in blocks. As you know, buttons can do lots of things in blocks, like navigating on pages, uh, controlling external devices. They can even do multiple things in, in one go. And many of those things you can do also with tasks and with you know more elaborate programming. But because buttons are so easy to program and so straightforward, uh, it's often all you need. Uh, and now this press behavior allows you to remotely sort of press that button from the outside. So if you have a functionality that you can express in terms of a button, now you can trigger that from anything. For example, I have a button right over here that steps forward in this, uh, in this sequence here. And I have also applied a behavior to that. You can see I have this button here. Now you see it has a press button assigned to it and it's bound to the red button and guess what this is the red button so now if i press the red button you can see the uh, scroller advances in exactly the same way as it did if i would have pressed the the button right there so the press behavior in one simple behavior adds all the possibilities that buttons bring to the table for control from the outside Another behavior that has been there for, for quite a while is the speed behavior. And let's start by showing you what the speed behavior can do. So I'll, I'll put the uh, behavior on the main display. And then I have this little throttle thing on the, uh, on the touch screen. And now if I move the, uh, the slider down here, you can see that I make the plane rev up and it goes faster and it goes slower and there's a little indicator at the top there as well above the plane that shows you the, the, the engine speed essentially. So how does this work? Well, it's quite simple. You just have the airplane video and there's the speed behavior connected to it that takes its speed from the slider, the, uh, the video speed slider that I have here. Now, when it comes to changing speed with video, you can understand that you can you know, just change the frame rate. Uh, but with audio, uh, there are really two options. Either you just make the audio play slower, but keep the pitch, or you make the audio play slower and change the pitch. So that's the uh, new addition here that you now have control over whether it should retain the pitch or change the pitch. And that was actually a suggestion from one of our customers that wanted to use this exactly for the purpose of uh, playing in this case playing I think it was only a sound file and and that was to to uh, mimic the sound of an engine and they wanted to be able to change the speed of the engine from the outside from some kind of physical pedal I believe uh, so they wanted to uh, to be able to control the audio pitch uh, uh, in the, in, independently uh, and that's how this checkbox here came to be so now if I turn up the audio you will hear the audio and since I don't have preserve audio pitch checked here, it will change the pitch of the audio. So let's start out real slow here. Okay, so that's the speed behavior and a small enhancement, but for that customer, very important. And that's typical for the way we work with blocks. It's very much driven by the feedback we get from you guys. So if there is something you really want to have in blocks and you, or you, you think that is something that can be enhanced, just let us know and we'll be happy to take a look at it. Okay, uh, that's all I wanted to say about behaviors. Uh, 
and on to something completely different. Now, Blocks 5 adds support for external databases and other data sources. And one of the chief applications of this feature is integration with existing asset management systems or collection databases. Such systems are often used by museums and such to keep track of their objects, metadata and associated images, video and so on. Examples of such specialized systems include Adlib from Axial and the Omeka open source database. And here to tell you more about how this works is Shannon from the Zuiderzee Museum in Holland. Hey, welcome to the Museum. I am Shannon from Oude, I am here data manager and I will tell you something about our Adlib API. Welcome to the Museum. In February of this year, kort voordat we allemaal in deze coronatoestand terecht kwamen, opende in het Zuiden Zeemuseum de nieuwe vaste tentoonstelling, Zeevol Verhalen. In plaats van traditionele tekstbordjes bij de objecten, wilden we gebruik gaan maken van schermen. De informatie over objecten moest wel direct uit Adlib komen. Het moest wel een live koppeling zijn, zodat we gemakkelijk teksten konden aanpassen en leuke aanvullende interessante info konden laten zien, zoals foto's en filmpjes. We wilden daarnaast ook een audiotour. Hallo, ik ben Joost. En ik ben Hans. Wij zijn steenzetters. En in de schepenhal, de openingszaal, een showcontrol met licht en een openingsfilm. De grote watersnood van 1916 geeft u de Deze laatste dingen wilden we niet in Altip verwerken. En toch wilden we dat alles, zowel de objectinformatie als de audiotour en de showcontrol, van het één systeem ingericht en bestuurd kon worden. Dat werd Blocks, gemaakt door het Zweedse bedrijf Pixilab. Hoe de pre-ref of het recordnummer uit Adlib in Blocks wordt gebruikt om het object op te halen. In Adlib wordt de informatie op deze manier verwerkt. Hierdoor hebben we er ook voor gezorgd dat alle teksten die conservatoren altijd voor tentoonstellingen schrijven, niet verloren gaan. Ze worden altijd direct in Adlib opgeslagen. Na de heropening in juni konden we de schermen niet gebruiken en hiervoor heeft Hans ook een oplossing gemaakt. Via de eigen mobiel zijn, als je bent ingelogd in de wifi van het museum, de schermen toch te benaderen en de informatie terug te vinden, inclusief de gerelateerde mediabestanden. Dit systeem om informatie in gerelateerde foto's en video's bij onze objecten te tonen bevalt enorm goed. Het werkt snel en door de live koppeling met Adlib kunnen we onmiddellijk informatie wijzigen, updaten of veranderen zodat het een dynamisch geheel blijft. Ook kunnen we het tentoonstellingen en willen we het in ons buitenmuseum gaan gebruiken. Daarnaast blijft de informatie duurzaam opgeslagen in Adlib, zodat het harde werk wat conservatoren altijd doen voor tentoonstellingen niet na afloop van de tentoonstelling meteen... Kortom! Thanks, Shannon, for that high-energy video clip. Uh, as you saw, this capability allows you to integrate content from an external collection database into blocks. A collection database or digital asset management system is used by many museums and, uh, to track all their objects and may include text, images, video, and other data. data. I have two such examples here, one uh, where the database is in Australia and the other one in Holland. So let's start with this one. And here you can see uh, an example of such a museum collection. And it looks similar to the one that Shannon showed in the video. This one shows uh, little toy cars, matchbox cars instead. And again, you can click one of them and you go into a page where you see some more information about the car. And there are some additional pictures from other angles on the car here. You can go back, you can pick something else. Let's take this bus here and there are a couple of images on that one as well. And these images, you can see they take a little while to load and the reason for that is that both the text and all the images come directly from the database on the other side of the planet over the internet. Uh, so this is an open collection database uh, from a museum 
see if I can bring up the uh, the webpage from a Museum of Applied Arts and Sciences in Sydney, Australia. And they have kindly opened up their API so it can be accessed over the internet. Uh, normally you would have the collection database closer at hand than on the other side of the planet, maybe in the same building, or at least so you know you have a good connection to it, a good fast connection. But the whole point of this is that you don't need to copy content over uh, from another system into blocks in order to build presentations. You can directly use uh, the, uh, the content that's already there. So why should you integrate the collection database with blocks in this way? Well, as you, as you know, this is how blocks works. You have the block server and that connects to the network and that con connects to all your display spots like Frederick has shown you on the side here with the, with the various screens, the touch screens and the display spots and you can have mobile devices and, and iPads and, and phones and what have you. And those are all collectively referred to as display spots. That's where the content is, is shown. And uh, normally the content is all stored on the block server, the content that is being produced in, in the blocks editor. But for a uh, collection database, you already have all the con uh, content in the collection database. So instead of manually copying over the stuff that you think you want to show to your visitors, you just link up blocks to your collection database and it will pull the content directly from the database, which also means that if you want to make any changes, if you want to add images, you want to remove something, you just do that in the database. And that uh, often has a, 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 a user interface that the the uh, uh, people that that run the the museum or whatever it is are already familiar with because it, most of them already use such a system. So this is a great way to make sure that the content that's that's reproduced in blocks or maybe on their website or in any any other uh, use case comes from the same uh, collection database and is always up to date. There are two concepts behind this database feature. The first one is called feed scripts. And a feed script is similar to a, a, a user script or a driver in blocks. Uh, that's a, a little piece of programming code that in the case of the, of the device of a device driver knows how to talk to a projector or a display or you know a pan tilt camera or any other device that you may want to connect to to blocks. But in this case, the script talks to the database instead. So you can think of it of, as kind of a database driver that converts from the language spoken by the database, which may be JSON or XML or SQL or you know any of these other acronyms, over to something that can be directly used in blocks, that you can just bind your content in blocks to the data coming from the database. The other concept is called a child block replication. And let's take a look at one, uh, at one of the blocks that were actually used in the, in, the, uh, in the example you just saw with the little toy cars. And here you can see that we're in a block and there is a single composition over here. But this block is, is uh, housed in a grid, which is another new block type. And that's how all these little toy cars appeared in a grid fashion, because it, they were in a grid block. But there is only a single composition in here. So where did all the, the cars come from? Well, they all, they're all really the same. They all look the same and, and work the same. So we really only need one, and then blocks will replicate this single child block, this single composition, as many times as needed for the, the collection that you want to show. And that's based on what's called child replication, which is a new feature that you can see over here. Uh, replication can also be used by other block types uh, in addition to grid that can be used in the scroller, in a slideshow and in a book. So for example, in a slideshow, the replication will create slides, uh, as many slides as are needed. And Matthias will show you some examples of that later on. Uh, 
And of course, the fact that we have a, a, a feed script talking to the database also makes it very easy to expose another collection. So here I have another collection from the same museum uh, that appears in the, with a very similar structure. You can see it's the same same kind of grid, and I can still go into one of these uh, objects. Let's take this one and uh, take a look, and you can see it takes a little while for it to load the image. And now you see it's totally different content, totally different text. Uh, let's go for for this little ship here, and you can see the content again is loaded and works in the same way, uh, but it's a different collection and. Changing to another collection is, is literally a single line that you specify the name of the collection uh, in, in, in blocks. And then it will pull the content from that collection instead and present it in the same way. So if you have multiple collections of objects that you may want to show in different, different touch stations or, or kiosks in, 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 a, in, in, in the building, then you can use something like this to make that work, the work of, of exposing all those really fast and simple because they, they're all really, at, at the end of the day, the same. It's just that they contain different objects. Uh, the, uh, if we go back to the, uh, the composition we have here, if you look inside of it, you can see that it also uses, uh, it, it, it's, it contains really just two things. It contains the thumbnail image and a big button sitting on top of it, an invisible button. That was the, the button that took me to the details page. And the thumbnail image uses another new block type called a media URL. It's similar to the media file that has been in there from from the very beginning, but instead of being uh, of being based on file that you drop into blocks, this is based on a URL that in this case is provided from the uh, collection database. And blocks then goes out and fetches the image from in this case from the actual collection database in Australia. Uh, so you always have the correct uh, content or the most up to date content in your presentation. The uh, media URL is also used then inside the, I mentioned earlier that it can be used in a slideshow. So here we have such a slideshow called, just called images down here. You can see this is a slideshow and it has a single slide, which is then replicated again by the same mechanism. We have this child replication. So this single slide will be replicated as many times as needed for the additional images. And you can see again, the large image uses the media URL to bring in from, from and this is how you bind it. You just say where you want this bound in, and you can see there are two options for the images here. There's a large image and the thumb, thumbnail image. Uh, so this is how the content is brought into blocks. And if we go back out and we look inside the grid, and go into this, you can see that once you're inside this composition, you have access to the thumbnail, but also all the other uh, information related to this database record. So there's a brief description, there's a detailed description, it has an ID and it has a title and whatever data that can be provided from your collection database backend can be exposed and directly used in blocks. So the idea is that you have two roles here. You have someone that prepares the feed script, and that's a person that knows about databases, knows about XML and SQL, and you know, all these, these complicated database stuff. And then that exposes the data with these kind of regular blocks properties that you just saw right in here, which allows anyone familiar with blocks to just bind to these properties as you do anything else in blocks. So you have these two roles, the database backend expert, and then you have the blocks producer, if you so will, that can then easily use that without having to know anything about how to talk to the backend database. There is a, an application note uh, about this and uh, Matthias will come back and talk a little bit more about all our great application notes that are in our wiki on the web. So that's what's new in Blocks 5. The locator does QR codes and GPS for outdoor navigation. 3D now does both panoramic environments and 3D models and the external database integration based on feed scripts and replication.
Uh, and of course, it contains numerous other minor features and, and bug fixes and, you know, the usual suspects. And there's a complete list of what's new and changed also in our wiki. Next up, Matthias will show you another use of database integration as well as a number of other interesting blocks applications. But before that, I'll hand it over to Hans from Bureau Jorwit in the Netherlands to see how he uses the new feature of uh, of database integration with blocks. Hans is a well-known expert in database-driven interactive presentations that knows everything about databases and these kinds of connections. So take it away, Hans. My name is Hans Redesveli. I'm a developer of uh, presentations connected to databases. Over one year ago, I got involved in a project with uh, the Zuider Zee Museum in which uh, blocks was used and the, the museum asked the implementers, well, how do we use our data of Adlib in this uh, configuration? Let's start with, with the Zuiderzee Zee Museum and show you the, the way the blocks are built and what the results are in a spot. What you see here are uh, a couple of earlier prepared blocks. For each touchscreen, we have a block. And let's open up uh, this one. It's a touchscreen with two themes, postcards and other collection. We have two languages available. When I open up a theme screen, I have my language buttons here. And here I have got my two buttons to choose a theme. The only thing the button does is setting a name of the feed to postcards and switch over to the list screen. It's very simple. This grid is connected to a feed and it doesn't know which feed because the previous screen will tell it what the name of the feed is. That also is configured in the detail screen. What you see here is all the fields that are sh shown. Uh, the title, uh, an object number, the description, an image. They are all connected to a feed and you can select a certain field with the data. The same is for the still. It's just a very simple page in which we can show a video or a still image. And if there is a title or a caption, it will show it also. What is the result of such a block? How does it show itself? Let's do it in a full screen mode. It's in Dutch and we can call the postcards in Dutch, get some information in Dutch, some extra information, some metadata. And in this case, we have extra media. This extra media is in, in this, it is a still image. Okay, so we can also change the language. At this stage, the data is again called from the database and only the English language data. So we now have the English data and the English metadata. But I can also show you, for instance, another type of media and I know this uh, block will show you Processing, we have again extra media, which is a video. Within that rather simple structure of a block with four elements, four pages. Those are the only pages we have. And all that information is built on the moment you click on a button. Which database is used? is not important for blocks. We got a feed name, 
we use it and where it comes from doesn't matter. So I'll switch over to the Trends Museum. When I open this page, well, it looks, but the buttons are exactly the same. So, how does it look like? There it is, the Trends Museum. When I open it up, I see data, but the source is completely different. So when I look at a certain object, I notice a couple of things. A typo. It can use some extra media. So let's switch over to the tool we use to edit our content. That's a collection management system. The collection management system can be Adlib, but in this case, and I do that in Omega, an open source collection management system. So let's open that up and we see here a list of objects. There is a, an object with a wrong description. It, got, it was boerderij instead of boerderij. Let's go into the record. We see here a, a part of the input that's wrong. So let's edit this object. And let's add a picture. Let's go to media. Got some puppies ready for the demo. So when I store this, it's already added to the database, to the collection management system. But if I switch back to the touchscreen, reloading the data is just something we do like this. We go back to the starting page of this touchscreen, open the same theme again, and now the data is refreshed. Like we see here. The typo is gone. And I've got edit new image with a caption. Basically, you're using your collection management system as a content management system. Thank you for uh, watching and bye. Thank you, Hans, for uh, sharing that excellent uh, success story. Before, we learned from uh, Mike how feeds are useful in a database context. I want to show you two more examples that utilize both feeds and uh, child replication, replication featuring blocks. They both apply when you want to be able to handle data in a structured way and perhaps change the data without having to edit the content manually within the editor itself. Uh, in my first example, uh, I uh, have a little spreadsheet uh, up in Google Docs. It's uh, uh, in the cloud. It uh, contains uh, just six, five, five entries about, so not, not that many, but I intend to, to edit this on a daily basis. And this would uh, be one way of doing that. Uh, the, the nice thing with, block, uh, with the, the Google thing is that you can uh, uh, set the access to different people and you can also automatically publish a CSV file with the content that the, the block server via the feed script can access and uh, get the data from. Uh, in this case, it is uh, like a welcome screen that uh, you may would find in a uh, reception at the corporate office or perhaps at a venue, uh, perhaps uh, some sort of event menu when you get visitors to different companies and stuff like that. Uh, it looks like this. Uh, and as you can see, the, my, my uh, entries in that little spreadsheet is, is uh, styled and looks nice on the screen. And this is a normal slideshow. So all I did was a slideshow with one single uh, uh, single composition. And there within that, I made the layout and some styling to the text. And then I used the child replication to just uh, replicate that into to as many uh, entries that we got here. So if I would uh, uh, carry on and type more entries into that file, I would get more on the screen. Uh, I have a second uh, example 
still the same setup with the, the spreadsheet. As you can see, I have much more data in here. So this is a list that I found on the internet with all the football players that ever played the UEFA Champions League final. And uh, this is pretty static. Uh, obviously, every year you will get uh, new ones to this list. But uh, uh, still, the, the list is uh, uh, pretty static. But as you can see, it's a lot of entries. So creating this in blocks uh, the manual way would be quite a hassle, to be honest. It's uh, maybe a couple of hundreds uh, of entries. Uh, so that's why it is useful to use the child replication feature here as well. And in, uh, even though I just w did one single template in blocks, I get all this done for me in a, a scroll. Uh, so it can be browsed by, by the user uh, and it's styled or, and the layout is as you want it. So it's very ben beneficial and time saving, saving uh, to do it this way. I have uh, made an application out for this uh, particular case, uh, how to set this all up in uh, on Google, and also how to adjust uh, the little field script a bit, and finally how to do this all this in, in blocks and uh, create the layout. Uh, it's on the wiki, uh, pixelab.se slash docs. And as you can see here, we have uh, we have quite a few of these actually. So you you may uh, try them out and see what we got there. Uh, it's uh, useful in different scenarios. Now I'm going to uh, introduce you to some sensors and actuators from a company called Nextmosphere. Uh, they do uh, they do small electrical devices that uh, that uh, is being used in the signage industry in retail industry mainly I think uh, in this case we found them and we think they are very useful in in uh, many many applications uh, that uh, blocks is interesting for uh, so we made a driver for this and uh, uh, it is based around the central little hub the, the, the one on the image is tiny like this. And it has uh, this particular one has eight in IOs inputs or outputs, uh, and the 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 hub or the controller is then in turn talking to to blocks uh, and let let blocks know uh, about any changes to anything. Uh, we have got uh, in front of me or on this side of me a presence sensor. Uh, that can be useful in applications where you want to sense if someone approaches or passes uh, the distance to something and then act on that uh, in your perhaps in your digital content or in the environment around the uh, installation. Uh, I got my uh, kindly enough. Uh, if you just flash your hand in front of that, that will reset to, to what it was. So I got Frederick to help me. That arm that comes in here is, is Frederick's hand. <laughs> And uh, he's going to show you that presence sensor. They come in different flavors, depending on which range you want. If you want to, to like a an, uh, one and a half meter sense or 10 meter sense and all that. Uh, and as you can see, in this case, I have uh, connected that uh, uh, the value direct to the uh, behavior that controls the scale on that Nextmosphere logo. Uh, we have also a setup with the RFID stuff here so that we can show and uh, um, the RFID sensors in, in this context, uh, it's uh, created to be able to sense if someone pick up an object or put down an object. So uh, uh, they are not really made for uh, the standard uh, RFID when you want to know uh, an individual uh, or something like that, a, a serial number or a name or something. Uh, but you can use it for sensing objects. And uh, in one scenario, you maybe you have a range of objects and then you need one antenna for, for every object. And that is when you want to detect whether someone lifts an object and which uh, object was lifted. The other uh, setup uh, is when you have many objects and uh, one single antenna. When you bring the object to the actual antenna, and then you, 
in content and react on that and and uh, do whatever you want to do in the either in the in the digital content or in the environment so we have a, a sample here or a demo of that frederick is going to show you a logo a, a little cardboard box with the pixel up logo so when he brings the pixel lab logo onto the table you get the pixel lab logo on the screen and uh, you can also see the data that is received the tag number and whether it's uh, placed which is that true and false boolean uh, and i have also programmed a little feedback in inside blocks so we, we get some feedback when we detect something on that led right in front of the sensor and the next one is something that is uh, pretty actual now, uh, considering the COVID situation, uh, when things will be opening up soon. Uh, and uh, it's a gesture sensor that can be used to navigate within content uh, uh, instead of a touchscreen, really, uh, because this is kind of, you know, you get quite a lot of uh, uh, thumbs on this uh, over the day. And uh, by using that technology, you don't uh, need any touch really. You can put that in the table in front of, uh, or uh, within the furniture in front of a screen or something like that. And this particular one uh, can sense uh, through a, a wooden top about uh, 25 to 40 millimeters uh, through glass, anything that is not meta metal. Uh, we got a little demo here as well, uh, and it can sense uh, up down, left, That's and really right. <laughs> and it can also work as an encoder that, where you can actually change the value or, or connect it to something else. If you do a clockwise circle with your fingers, you can change. I, I, this I programmed myself. So all we do here is really change the number. But obviously, this could be, have been connected to a, 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 a behavior of some, some graphics or uh, maybe the light intensity of the lamps in the room or whatever. Uh, so it's pretty useful uh, for many situations and to demonstrate this uh, make it very clear uh, this is a more realistic example when we use it to navigate in a, uh, a book so uh, Frederick is now changing the pages uh, by his gesture It's very useful and uh, easy to set up uh, uh, both uh, the mechanical stuff and uh, and also easy within blocks to use it. The driver that we uh, have, uh, uh, the release driver, has uh, uh, support for the presence uh, range, the motion range, the gender range and the uh, RFID and this uh, air gesture that we just showed you and uh, the, the range of buttons as well. They do have uh, more sensors than we have in our driver, but it's quite easy to, to add, uh, uh, add new ones. We will, uh, as we mentioned before, put links into uh, to, uh, our follow-up email with uh, web addresses and useful uh, uh, addresses that we talked about during these sessions. Uh, on our web page, we have an events page that is pixelab.se slash events. Uh, this is where we uh, advertise our training sessions or webinars or uh, other events if there will be exhibitions shortly in the future, hopefully. Uh, as you can see, there are a few up there right now. Uh, we've got one there in, in France, which is uh, in person. Uh, uh, training and then we have uh, finally the uh, uh, blocks advanced training announced for the 11th of May which is a, an online uh, training the first one uh, the first advanced one where we will, will be covering more details around behaviors and uh, parameters and uh, the uh, task programming and that sort of things
I'll just say thank you to Morten, to Shannon, and to Hans for their uh, generous contributions to what we're doing here. And a special shout out to Peter Lindquist for the beer caps example there. And of course, thanks to all of you guys that have spent uh, two hours watching our first attempts at doing webcasts here. I hope you enjoyed it. And please join us on the forum and ask any follow-up questions that you have there. And the forum is at pixelab.se forum. Thank you and goodbye.